A huge thank you to all the super sponsors who make it possible for me to make these videos. Visit David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. Up until now, the player hasn't really had any incentive to save up the orbs they've collected. As long as they haven't reached 200 health, they might as well immediately cash them in and take the health boost. Let's reward accumulating orbs more by letting the player exchange them for better items if they hold on to them. At the most basic level we could do something like this in our orb recharge handler. A list of more if statements checking if the number of orbs is greater than certain thresholds, and adjusting the inventory item in quantity accordingly. But this is very verbose and unwieldy, and if we wanted to have some representation of the item that the player can currently buy on screen, which we will, then we would need another entire stack of if statements in the render overlay function to handle that. Instead, let's set up a data store that we can consult wherever we need to. First, we need a new class that can hold everything we need to represent a buyable item. We need to know the cost of the item, the quantity and type of inventory object that buying it will give to the player, and how the item will be represented visually. Orb buyable item is a value object. Unlike everything else we've implemented so far, it isn't a thinker or an event handler, and the game won't apply any special behaviour to it. It's just there to hold data for us. It works exactly like a class in any other object-oriented language. It has four class variables, and an approximation of a constructor that accepts values for each of them and assigns them. The only variable that does something different is the texture. We use textman to look up the texture ID for the texture name provided instead of just storing it as a string, so that we can avoid having to look it up every time when we're reading the data. Now we need to set up another thinker which will store a collection of these objects and provide a function to tell us which one's currently available to the player. While this isn't an official piece of terminology, I tend to use the term data library for a thinker that's used to look up data in this way, so this will be our orb data library. It's going to start out looking a lot like our orb multiplier thinker with the init function get instance and get read only instance. I started off by just copy and pasting these functions, then removing the orb multiplier thinker's instance variables, and changing orb multiplier thinker to orb data library every time it was mentioned. This time though, we're going to assign this thinker the stat static stat number instead of stat user, and we therefore use stat static in the thinker iterators as well. Giving a thinker the stat num stat static makes the object a static thinker, which gives it a couple of special properties. It will keep its state throughout the game, carrying over between maps, and gzdoom won't call its tick function. These features make static thinkers a good choice for objects that only need to be set up once and are called when they're needed, instead of having to be updated constantly. They make a good alternative to putting things in ACS's global variables or storing things in the player's inventory. Our orb data library doesn't actually store anything yet, so let's now add an array of buyable items and populate it by creating several of those objects. We'll do the population as part of the orb data library's init function, adding a few lines that will do several things at once. First, we know we want to create a new orb buyable item object. Having done that, we'll immediately call its init function to give it some values. First is the number of orbs this item will cost, then the lump name of the graphic that we want to use to display it. As you may have noticed, despite their names, Textman and Check for Texture can deal with any graphic in the WAD and not just the images for walls that Doom traditionally calls textures. For our 10 health point bonus, I'll use the sprite for the stim pack. For the third and fourth parameters, we give it the class name and quantity of the inventory object to give, in this case 10 health bonuses. With that orb buyable item set up, we immediately want to add it to this orb data library's array of items, and we do this by calling the push function on the array. Take a look at the arrays page on the Zdoom wiki for more about how to work with them. We can set up several lines like this to make a catalogue of buyable items. For this example I've set up the rewards as health bonuses equivalent to the stim pack medikit and soul sphere, then a berserk pack and a megasphere at the top of the range. This list could include any obtainable item. You might even want to include some custom ones. So now that we have an array of possible items to buy and the number of orbs at which they'll become available, the last thing we need to do here is provide a method that will give us the highest value item that's available to the player. This function isn't going to be static and will belong to the actual orb data library object, so the calling code will need to use the get instance or get read only instance static functions first to retrieve it. It will loop through the buyable items array and find the highest priced one that has a cost equal to or lower than the value we pass in, which will be the player's current orbs. Now that the data library is prepared, we just have to alter the classes that will access it. 
On the UI we want to display the item that the player currently has available, and when the Orb Recharge event is fired we need to look up the appropriate items to give the player. This doesn't involve any completely new concepts, we just have to consult the data library and use the data we get back from it to draw things to the screen or decide how to manipulate the player's inventory. Let's first go to the Network Process function in our UI handler. Under here I'm removing some of our previous code so that we can replace it with the results of our call to the thinker. Then we're going to get the read-only instance of our orb data library, get the top buyable item from it given our current orb count, and put that in a variable called buyable item. If we were given any buyable item back, we'll take the number of doom orbs from the player's inventory equal to the cost of the buyable item. Our give inventory call will similarly use the object class name and quantity from our buyable item object. The UI part will be handled at the bottom of our increasingly lengthy render overlay function. Here we'll start off with the same line we did in network process, getting the read-only instance and the top buyable item from it. After checking that a buyable item exists, you're pretty much free to do whatever you like with it. I'm drawing the image for the buyable item to the right of our existing arrangement, and then a string showing its cost next to that. Again, there's nothing truly new here, but there are a couple of things to point out. The first is that I'm using a function called draw texture instead of draw image. This is exactly the same, but it takes a texture ID instead of a string to represent the image file. The image alignment flags will ignore all the existing offsets and just display the image from wherever you specify. We also have to remember to coerce the buyable item's cost into a string before putting it in the draw string function. It's finally time to start the game up again and see the results of our efforts. Bear in mind that if you've set things up like I have, you won't see an item on the screen immediately, and you'll have to give yourself orbs from monsters or through the console for the player's orb count to go above the first threshold we defined in our orb data library. But now, once you have sufficient orbs, you should be able to see our chosen graphics appearing on the screen, and them changing as the player collects more orbs. Pressing the key you set up for cashing in should also give you the appropriate item. This project is pretty much feature complete now. We've learned how to set up new actor classes with special behaviours, store and retrieve data, display things on the screen and react to input into events in the game. And with just these elements, Zscript has a ton of possibilities to explore. In the tenth video, however, I'd like to show you how we can create and read our own custom data lumps instead of having to specify large stacks of data in the code. 